Good morning, Riverside and friends. I'm Michael Livingston, the interim senior minister here at the Riverside Church in New York City. And I wish you were here with me. You can hear what you've just heard, Carillon and Oregon. Those of us who are here in the nave can feel it, feel the vibrations, the rich sounds flowing through us in this magnificent space. We will again gather here. But first we have to continue to get through this difficult moment in the life, not just of us at Riverside or New York City, but the whole world. These rising numbers again here in our states this rising toll of death, these fires still burning in California. We have so much work to do, and we're voting. Millions already voting for the kind of change that we need to transform our living. And so we're voting, and so we continue to gather as we can to worship together the God who creates and sustains and nurtures us all. Download the bulletin, join in on the chat if you choose to, or simply enlarge the screen and experience it without the chat. Closed captioning is available We'll gather for our virtual coffee hour after the service for some conversation with our preacher, our own Kevin Vandiver. And that will be followed by discernment that's going on here at Riverside as we prepare to elect new lay leaders. There'll be a forum with those who are candidates for church council in the coffee hour today. Now let's hear first from Chanel Morrison. She's our new property manager. Four or five months she's been with us now and doing a marvelous job. And then from other Riverside staff. Greetings, I'm Reverend Bruce Lamb. A couple of education ministry announcements coming up next Saturday. We are having a conversation with author Carl Anthony his colleague. That conversation is taking place next Saturday, October 24th at one o'clock in the afternoon. You can find the Zoom link to join by going to trcnyc.org and clicking on the event on the calendar section of the website or reaching out to Alan Vince Letts for more information. Also, we invite you to join us. It's not too late to register for two new small groups this afternoon. Faith and Social Enterprise starts today as well as the class COVID-19 across Africa and its diaspora, dismantling colonialism and restoring justice. And here is Yemi from the African Fellowship to tell you more about this class. Hello, Riverside. My name is Yemi Abelia, and I am the Vice Chair of the African Fellowship, a ministry under Mission and Social Justice. Starting Sunday, October 18th from 1.30 to 3.30 p.m., the African Fellowship and MSJ, in partnership with the Ministry of Faith Formation, are presenting a four-part education series on the effects of COVID-19 on Africa and its diaspora. Each week, we'll explore a different topic theme to get a better understanding of how COVID-19 affected those of African descent within the geopolitical areas of Africa, the U.S., the Caribbean, and Latin America. Each week will also feature knowledgeable and prominent panelists who will help guide us through the process. For more information and to join our, our class, please visit the Ministry of Faith Formation page on the Riverside website. We look forward to you joining us. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Reverend Kevin Van Hook, and I serve as the Minister of Justice, Advocacy, and Change. And there's just one announcement from our Mission and Social Justice Commission this week. 
This upcoming Wednesday, October 21st, immediately following Grace Notes at 8 p.m., our beloved Earth community will be hosting a special program entitled The Elections, The Planet, and Our Future. In this program, we will be looking at the environmental records of the presidential candidates, as well as state and local legislation for environmental justice. This is a program you will not want to miss. Please join us, and you can find a link to that Zoom meeting on our church's website under MSJ. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible on Wednesday. God bless. Please join us in our responsive call to worship. Come, let us worship. Let the children come first. May the children find safety and protection in Christ's church. Come, let us pray for the youngest among us, that they may be both seen and heard. Children are fully human, created in the image of God. Children belong in our communities. Come, let us encourage the caretakers of this generation together. May God bless parents, grandparents, teachers, social workers, and other care providers. Join with me in prayer. God, we come together, those of us who are depressed, and those of us who are oppressed. We gather together to worship those of us who are hungry and those of us who are angry, those of us who are unemployed or underemployed. We gather together to worship, even though we are anxious, bitter, and frantic. We come to this place of blessing where we know we will find respite, peace, 
and joy. And we remember that we are all children. We are all children of our loving parent, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our epistle lesson is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. The first chapter beginning with the 18th verse for the message about the cross and foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the human wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age has not God made the foolish wisdom of the world for since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom. God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. We proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are who are the call, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God foolishness is wiser than humans human wisdom and God's weakness weeks weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider young call brothers and sisters, not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Things that are not to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. God is the source of your life, and Christ Jesus 
who became for us wisdom for God and outrageousness and sanctification and redemption in order that as it is written uh, let the one who boasts and boasts boast boast in God the word of God for the people of God thanks to be to God Our gospel lesson is from the Gospel of Luke, the 18th chapter, beginning with the 13th verse. The tax collector stands far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went home and he justified rather than the others. For all the who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. People were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they sternly ordered them not to do it. But Jesus called for them and said, Let the little children come to me and do not stop. Do not stop them from, for it is to such as those that the kingdom of God belongs. This is the gospel of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs> Let the little children come to me. And did you hear that? That he might touch them. I love that. Open our ears so that we might hear and see these children. To such as these, the kingdom of God belongs. Welcome to Children's Sabbath. Last year, our guest speaker, our preacher, was the Reverend Marcy. Well, not the Reverend, uh, rather Dr. Marcy Vandiver. And this Sunday, it is Kevin Vandiver in the PhD program, soon to join in a year or two his wife uh, as a doctor, as a scholar. You know Kevin if you've been around Riverside for the last stretch. Kevin left us in 2017, having served for several years among us as the Minister of Youth and Young Adults. He's a graduate of Winthrop University in South Carolina. He did his Master of Divinity degree at Duke University and again studying homiletics for his PhD at Princeton Seminary. He's ordained in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and he's the founding pastor of Christ Center at Transforma uh, Transfiguration in Harlem. Today he serves, in addition to being a PhD student, if that weren't enough, as the assistant to the Bishop of the Metropolitan New York Synod of the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome back to Riverside, back to this pulpit, the Reverend Kevin Vandiver.
Well, good morning, Riverside. It's so good to be back with you. I know it's been a while, but it's good to be here amongst uh, you. Uh, virtually, I wish I could give you hugs, handshakes, and high fives, but you'll just have to interact with me by using your chat feature. I'd like to thank uh, Reverend Livingston for this wonderful um, uh, invitation to speak with you today uh, because it has been a while, but uh, in my CDF Children's Defense Fund days go back quite a while to the year 2008 when I started as a servant leader intern, and I was just so glad to, sir, uh, to bring or to partner with Riverside to bring uh, the Riverside Freedom School here. Uh, uh, Riverside will always have a wonderful place in my heart, and I do not take this invitation lightly. I know that I stand in the place of many great speakers, and as uh, Reverend Livingston has already alluded, uh, one of those great speakers is my wife, you know, whose shoes I am unworthy to untie. Uh, I'm just so grateful to uh, be in partnership with her. She, Marcy is uh, here with us, and I bring you greetings from both of us. I just want to surround us with these words one more time, and then we will pray. People were bringing even infants to him, Jesus, that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they sternly ordered him not to do it, ordered them not to do it. But Jesus called for them and said, let the little children come to me and do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. Let us pray. Lord, let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I remember way back in the day sitting in a high school English course, we were reading Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. I think we'd been studying tragedies up to that point, and you know Shakespeare has a formula for those, so all through the reading of the play, I was waiting for the other shoe to drop. I knew that Julius was in for a downfall of some sort. And remember what the seer said to him? As we are careening toward the end of Julius Caesar, she said, beware the Ides of March. And what happened on the Ides of March? You know, they took Julius Caesar out in more ways than one. One of the most poignant moments of Julius's being deposed was when he looked at his buddy Brutus, who had a knife in his hand. And as Julius was expiring, he said, et tu, Brute, and you, Brutus, even you, Brutus. I was young, but I paused at that line. It was something to be said that Julius's friend was the one who, in the end, offered opposition that ended in Julius's demise. It was a friend, someone whom, with whom there was shared connection, who had journeyed along similar paths, who opposed Julius Caesar. The proverb says that wounds from a friend can be trusted, but sometimes the wounds from a friend, the, the kiss of a close disciple, those wounds can deal death. It's one thing to have opposition from out there, but altogether different when they are close. Come on, we know it's true. Nobody can wound you like the ones who are closest to your heart. No scars are as deep as the ones that are in, uh, are in reach to us. Even you, in our text, there are children being brought to Jesus by their parents. Now, there is no right or ceremonious way to do this. Usually, if there were a prophet among the people, the parents would bring their children to be blessed or to have the prophet to lay their hands upon the child. This is already striking because just like today, children did not have equal standing as adults in society. So it is particular that the writer records this incident. Suddenly, there is a commotion. As the parents are bringing their precious children to be blessed by Jesus, we lean in and hear somebody close speaking some stern words to the, par to the parents and the children. The disciples are trying to prohibit the parents and thereby the children from getting to Jesus. It's one thing 
to face opposition from somebody who you know doesn't like you too much. But it's a whole other thing when it is someone with whom you thought you'd had some shared connection. Of course, the shared connection is Jesus. But instead of opening the way to Jesus, the disciples instead are speaking sternly. They are seeking to prohibit the children speaking sternly. We would expect opposition from out there, but it comes from the disciples. Yes, the disciples who saw him. They saw Jesus heal the man with the legion and restore him to community. They saw him raise the child who was Jairus' daughter. They saw him casting out demons. Reverend Livingston, they saw him feeding the 5,000. They saw him healing the child with the demon. They saw him heal the woman bent over. They saw him cleanse the lepers and heard his teachings, the ones that exalted the poor and resisted the proud. And yet, these disciples are the ones speaking sternly to the children. Fred Craddock was right when he said, you can get an A in Bible, but still flunk Christianity. These theologically trained disciples with their stern talk have, have flunked. Oh, we've met these disciples. There's a slight familiarity to them. Like there's something that may be shared amongst us. We think the connection is Jesus, no doubt. And we still hear them speaking sternly today, speaking sternly, hailing from the theological school of two Corinthians and beyond, speaking sternly, telling us that our lives don't matter, telling us that we don't deserve to approach Jesus because of who we love or where we've been or who we are or what boxes we didn't check, telling us that we can't come any closer to Jesus, speaking sternly, telling others to stand back and stand by to do us harm, speaking sternly, speaking sternly. I hear you. Sticks and stones may break my bones, Reverend, but words will never hurt me. What's all the attention around these disciples' words? Words form ideologies that deal death. A, a word sternly spoken can become a death sentence. It can build a wall of separation between abundant life and death. Oh, a word sternly spoken can destroy dreams. A, a word sternly spoken can obliterate imaginations. A, a word sternly spoken can create societal webs of injustice justice, pits of poverty, and seas of apathy. Words sternly spoken may not directly break bones, but they can literally snuff out life. Stern words around bootstrap mentalities have resulted from, uh, from in children. Yes, children being the largest group of people in poverty in America. Stern words are affecting children. Yes, children who are more likely to harm themselves because of the omnipresent bullying that they experience. Stern words from so-called disciples steeped in American exceptionalism resulted in children. Yes, children in cages. Stern words have formed our ideologies that have left some children without adequate access to education. Stern words, stern words are making America great again for some, but not for those for whom it was never great. Stern words uttered, masked in pseudo-theology and uncritical claims have driven children of God from the church who have vowed to never come back. Stern words are issuing forth from the uppermost regions of power in our nation, causing it to be utterly shaken. Do not be Food. The stern words are more dangerous than we know. And many of us have fallen victim to the stern words of some misguided disciples. The words of the disciples, born out of faulty ideology, create a barrier to Jesus. Even you? We thought we knew who the disciples were. We share Christ in common. So we thought, these wounds from so-called friends sure do hurt. We would expect opposition from out there. But it's altogether different when you've been wounded by a disciple's stern words. The disciples show us this morning that you can think you know what Jesus wants and be terribly mistaken. 
walking with Jesus and wrong, talking with Jesus and wrong, watching Jesus' every move and still wrong, blocking the path to the paragon of justice and hope. If we were left to the mercy of these misguided disciples, there would be so much trouble for us. We with our backs against the wall, but there is some good news in this text. I know the disciples have been speaking sternly and they are talking a whole lot. When the disciples get it wrong, Jesus can speak for himself. Jesus is the visible expression of the invisible God, the one who in the middle of chaos spoke words and said, let there be light. Jesus, the one who calmed the sea with his words. Jesus, who brought Lazarus back with his words. The one who raised a little girl with his words. The one who had the first word and will have the last word, the alpha and the omega in the middle of the chaos and confusion of the disciples barring the way, Jesus breaks through the melee of stern speech and offers a corrective of his own. In the middle of destructive speech, Jesus offers creative speech, an alternative future for the displaced. Come. I know this is children's Sabbath and we are all somebody's child and all children of God. And I know we spend so much time on the faults of the disciples. You can see it everywhere. We lift up the faults of the disciples high. And if you want to see it, just turn on the TV. But from here on out, I want to talk to the children, the dispossessed, the ones of us being held back, the ones of us denied access. The ones of us who we do a lot of talking about, but not a lot of talking to. Who is talking to the children? What about the children? I want to talk to the child of God who is on the outskirts fighting past disciples and their ideologies to get to Jesus. You, you may be angry, you may be afraid, you may be sad, but that's okay. So am I. But Jesus has a word for us. Come. Come, yes, you children of God who have been told you're not good enough. Come, yes, you have been, uh, who have been fed bad theology by the disciples. Come, yes, you who have been subjected to death dealing of the greater society. You knew the disciples weren't right. You felt it deep within. You, you felt the disparity. You sensed the distance that the disciples tried to place between you and your creator. I came to Riverside today to tell you that Jesus' word is different from the disciples' word. Jesus says, let them come. This is a different outcome uh, than the disciples had prescribed. This brings about a different future, a, a new outcome for the displaced children. Come, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burdens are light. In the face of the disciples, no, Jesus says yes, and Michelle Williams and Beyonce were right when they said, when Jesus says yes, nobody, not even the disciples, can say no. I'm talking to you if you've been left down and let, let down and left out. You are worthy of love. And Jesus says, come. I, I don't care what the disciples said to you. Well I, well, I do care, which is why I'm here to tell you. Jesus says, come. The disciples can be anywhere. At work, in, at school, in some churches, on the TV, in governmental office, and even in your own house. I don't care what they said to you, child of God. You matter, your life matters, and Jesus says, come. But we're not under any illusions this morning, are we? Those disciples don't always listen to Jesus. They morph and change with the times. But we can see from the state of our world that somebody is always looking to block access to Jesus, the paragon of justice and hope. So what can we do? Sometimes you have to push past the disciples with 
whatever power you can muster. Sometimes if you don't have the power, you have to join with somebody who can help. It demands a push, a, a protest, even in times like these. I know you all are talking about women in the Bible right now. And I want to remind us of the story of the daughters of Zelophehad. Zelophehad had died and there came a time for Moses and the elders to divide up the promised land amongst the tribes of Israel. Since Zelophehad had no sons, his hereditary portion would have been lost. So his daughters came before Moses and all the elders and made their case. The opposition had been legislated. Women did not hold property in those days, but the daughters persevered, and in the face of what seemed like an obvious no, they pushed, they, they persevered, uh, they set precedent uh, uh, in the face of the obvious no, uh, for God said yes. Moses took it to God, and God uh, overruled the legislation and gave them a yes. Give them the land. Faced with opposition, they made a push, and God was on the other side of it with a yes. We know living epistles, too, who still walk amongst us, and, and that's what we'd call Marion Wright Edelman, you know? She was the first black woman to be admitted to the bar in Mississippi. She pushed past limitations and obstacles and founded the Children's Defense Fund. When the disciples rose up to seriously negate the lives of children, she started the Children's Defense Fund, which is the parent organization behind Freedom Schools, modeled after the Freedom Summer of the 1960s. When when society created opposition, when misguided disciples formed ideologies that kept children down, Miss Marion became the help that those babies needed to push past evil ideologies, to give children a boost that they could have so that they could have a fair, safe, healthy, and moral start. Make no mistake about it. Riverside Freedom School is not just a cutesy thing we do every year. No, it is literally destroying strongholds of darkness. So, my friends, you have a yes from Jesus, uh, but, but it may mean that you have to push. I'm under no illusion that pushing is easy. When you've been stepped on and stepped over and looked over, pushing becomes difficult and even harder at a time like this. But in the middle of a pandemic, Jesus' words to us are still the same. And so we have to keep pushing as much as we can. Push at the poles. Push at the border. Push for those babies in cages. Push for the right for women to choose what happens to their bodies. Push with people who are queer. Push with people who are black. Push for those who are without work. Push uh, for those who do not have a livable wage. Push with those who are without health care. Push for those who have not, who have lost hope. Push for those who are afraid. Push for those who are exhausted. Push. Have you ever tried to open a door that had something blocking it? One person may not be able to open a barricaded door all the way. Two people may not be able to open a barricaded door all the way. Three people may only be able to get the door to budge a little, but the more of us, the more children of God who get together and make a push, the more that door is going to open. And on the other side of the door, on the other side of the disciples' no, is Jesus's yes. I know the no almost got us. It, it, it's all that some of us have heard. We have lived in a society full of no's, worshiped in churches full of no's, lived in houses full of no's, washing dishes in what Dr. Teresa Fry Brown calls sorrow's kitchen. We internalized the no, didn't we? But that's all right because Jesus Jesus' yes presents a different future for us. If you can just manage to grab a hold of Jesus' yes, Jesus' yes is making crooked places straight. Jesus' yes is bringing high places down. Jesus' yes is making everything all right. Jesus' yes is bringing together all of God's children in harmony, equity, and justice. If you can just manage to grab a hold of Jesus' yes, his yes can become your yes, and you can get some strength to run on 
on just a little while longer and see what the end is going to be. That's why the elders of my tradition said, I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, I'll trust you and obey. When the Spirit gives me a yes, speaks to me with my whole heart, I'll agree. And my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. Don't give up the fight. Don't quit because when Jesus says yes, nobody, nobody can say no. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Today we join together and pray for Tony Ash Sr., Barbara Butler, Salone Clary, the nephew of Sammy Harris, Barbara Cunningham, Gladys and Morel Dooley, Tara James, Dr. Beatrice Bright Johnson, Janice Burnett Jones, Margaret Madden, Dr. Sherwood McClellan, Megan Pell, Mitzi Prince, Bernice Cozy Pulley, Joan Ricketts. Today, we join in grief with Evelyn Davis and her family upon the death of her sister-in-law, Renee Davis. For Zenobia Gray and her family upon the death of her nephew, Ivan James. Gloria Griffith upon the death of her brother-in-law, Kenneth L. Purser. Thomas and Bernadette Morton Johnson upon the death of their cousin, Laura L. Woods. And today, we take a moment of silence to pray for the more than 4,200 children in New York City who have lost at least one parent to the coronavirus. And we pray for children. We pray for the babies, for preschoolers, for new readers, for the children with learning disabilities, the children with behavioral disorders, immigrant children, children who are suffering abuse, children who do not have adequate medical care, children who are learning English as a second language, children in foster care. We pray for preteens, for middle schoolers, for high schoolers, and college students whose brains are not yet fully grown. We pray for children suffering hunger and thirst and lack of shelter. We pray for the children of our enemies. We pray for all caretakers, all caretakers, that we might find courage and energy to fight for the needs of our young ones. And we pray for our leaders to look upon a generation of children and choose to protect their habitat. We pray these things in the name of the one who called the children to the front. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom comes, thy will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Sleeping babies in the smiles on the faces of children have a way of melting hearts upon sight. There's just a purity, a peace that rests in their spirit. Well, this is a time when we tap into our inner child, our inner peace, and we pass that peace to the people we love and care about dearly. So in any way in which you can, pass the peace of the Lord to the people you care about. Send a message, send a text, share with someone near you, give them a call. Pass the peace. The peace of the Lord be with you.
Good morning, Riverside. I'm Dr. Emily Anderson, and this morning I want to talk with you about our youth outreach program, the Riverside Hawks. Many of you know that the Hawks have had a reputation for developing outstanding basketball players for the NBA. What you may not know is that for the past 16 years, the Hawks' mission has changed. We use basketball as a means of assisting youngsters to become successful adults in whatever career they choose. The Riverside Hawks is a not-for-profit organization with an active and engaged board of directors composed of entrepreneurs, business leaders, educators, and attorneys. Each board member is committed to our comprehensive youth development program. Hawks programming now includes online academic support, tutoring, social work services, assistance with high school admissions processes, test prep, and college counseling. When the COVID crisis shut down our facilities, we maintained Zoom workouts and drills with our youngsters. The tutoring sessions were moved to Google Hangout and SAT prep was held via Zoom. The Riverside Roundtable Zoom series brought community leaders and Hawks alumni to speak with and interact with our youngsters during the COVID lockdown. The Riverside Hawks program serves over 200 boys and girls from grades one through 12. They come from all over New York City to participate. 31% travel from the Bronx, 47% from Manhattan, with the majority from Harlem and Washington Heights. Smaller numbers come from Brooklyn, Queens, Westchester, and New Jersey. Why do they come to Riverside? Many of the youngsters come with the aspiration of becoming a professional athlete. Our coaches are phenomenal, and they teach students basketball fundamentals and skills. But in addition, they mentor and help youngsters and their parents figure out the best pathway to success. Many of our youngsters start with us in grade school and stay with the Hawks through high school and on to college. These youngsters stay with us because this is a positive environment where each child is valued, respected, and encouraged to be his or her best self. Here is some data. All of our 34 graduating seniors are attending college now. That is 100% high school graduation rate and 100% college attendance. Hawks are currently in their freshman year at Lehigh University, Lincoln University, Ryder University, Cornell University, Eastern Carolina University, Penn State University, Bronx Community College, SUNY Polytech, Quinnipiac University, University of Georgia, and Stanford University, among others. Two weeks ago, we completed a fantastic robotics workshop series that included youngsters from our Saturday Night Lights program. In cooperation with the New York City Police Department, we were able to close off Claremont Avenue so that more youngsters could participate. We are doing great work with our boys and girls, and we need your help. To support our programs, we sponsor our annual fundraising gala. This year, our virtual gala will happen on October 29th. It is virtual, so all of you can join us from the comfort of your living room. No tickets to purchase. We truly need your financial support and of course, your continued prayers as we seek to break the cycle of poverty and underdevelopment of our youth. Please donate to the Hawks Gala by going to our website, riversidehawks.org. As a Riverside Church member for 35 years, I'm also encouraging you to give your regular donation to the support of the wonderful work of Riverside, our church home. For everyone worshiping with us today, we invite you to give through our website at trcnyc.org 
slash give or text TRCNYC give to 77977 to donate from your telephone. Thank you very much and God bless you. pray. Creator of all, big and small, may these humble gifts express our commitment to nurture the future generations of the church. For all that is within your view, bring forth an expansion of comfort to all through the blessing of these gifts. No matter how big or small, bless the giver, replenish their stores, inspire them to extend your love to every woman, man, and child as we grow in community together. Today, we celebrate the ministry of our Riverside Kids Worship, which provides a sacred space for children to connect with God in song, movement, art, and storytelling. Thank you for each of their beautiful spirits. In your name we pray. Amen.
we remember Kevin for his kindness and generosity, for his good humor, his sense of style, his wonderful spirit. He's reminded us this morning that we ought to remember him as a preacher here among us, speaking words of hope and promise. He's reminded us that we need to be careful about what we say and how we say it. And I know what words I'm going to take away from that sermon this morning. Come. Jesus says, come, whoever you are. All of us are welcome. And Jesus says, yes, it can be done. His yes is ultimate, overcoming whatever barriers anyone might put in our way. And I'm going to remember, too, that we have to push. This just, change doesn't just fall in our laps. Transformation doesn't just happen without our effort, without our pushing. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen.